Hello, and welcome to Time of Death. Welcome. We're your hosts, Dee and Riss. Yes, welcome. What welcome. week is this, Larissa? This is <laughs> this is week seven. So I'm bad at remembering the the, they, week, the they, episode numbers. They all blur together after a certain I point. I know, after we've been doing this for so long. And we are now on like this very aggressive uh, social media campaign. <laughs> Yeah, aggressive. In, in quotations, aggressive. <laughs> um, but again, if you like what you're hearing today, feel free to give us a follow, rate, review, listen, share it with your friends and family members. We are two nurses with emergency medicine and psychiatric background, and we are just ready to share stories about true crime with our influences on them yes help us retire from the bedside guys yes thank you please (laughs) please help you know it's bad (laughs) okay anyway moving on d take it away all right so this week we have the infamous and uh very publicized in recent times dr christopher daniel dunch Mm. He was born in the 70s. Oh, so yeah, recent. Yeah, he's a pretty, uh, he's a new figure on the serial killer scene. (laughs) So he was actually a neurosurgeon, which I thought was very, very interesting. Um, He also is nicknamed Dr. Death, much like Mm. Shipman. Oh, yeah, I remember us covering Shipman in episode two. Uh, Yeah, I think think that's it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think it was two, so... Let's get into it. I'm ready. So, Chris Dunch was born uh, actually in Montana, and then shortly after moved to Tennessee. He lived with his dad, who was a physical therapist and also a Christian missionary, Mm -hmm. and his mom, Susan, who was a teacher. He, like, had a very white picket upbringing from what I was able to find um, he graduated from evangel evangel <laughs> evangelical <laughs> christian high school which it was in a small suburb of memphis and he was like their star football player he actually played football in high school he started at a division three college Millsaps college and then transferred to a Division I um, school, Colorado State University. Uh, Division I is the best, isn't it? Yeah, it's the okay. best. And I guess at that point, like he was really rising star. And his teammates later said that although he worked really, really hard to excel in football, overall he just lacked talent. So hard work only got him uh, so far. Couldn't push him over the hump. Nope. So after... He went back home to Memphis, where he attended Memphis State University, which is now the University of Memphis. Okay. So, after his football career ended, he was devastated. So, he just couldn't make it because he didn't, wasn't talented enough at the end of the day. Yeah, he, he worked really, really hard, they were saying, but just overall, he didn't have what it took to play professionally. So, at that point, he shifted. He decided to pursue medicine, which is a radical new mindset to take. So he completed his undergrad in 1995 and then went on to an MD-PhD program. He completed that program in 2010 and then started a neurosurgery residency program at the University of Tennessee and completed a spine fellowship program at Semes Murphy Clinic in Memphis. Hmm. So, very, very educated individual. That hard work that he put on the football field now was translated over into medicine. Mm -hmm. So, he could have, like, when he put his mind to something, he really did excel. There was a lot of potential and talent there, for sure. Mm -hmm. Dunch completed his residency... However, there was a red flag. What was the red flag? So in his residency, he only took part in 100 surgeries. I guess, like, normally it's supposed to be over 1,000. Yeah, that seems like a very low number. 
So he, at this point, this is questionable. He was not adequately trained at that point, which later on comes into play um, during his residency. Obviously, on-the-job training is a different story, and he's going to get experience. But that residency experience, which is so critical, mm-hmm. was definitely lacking. And yeah, that's how you're learning to be a surgeon. Yeah. So during that time of his residency, he was suspected of being under the influence of cocaine. Oh, boy. (laughs) While he was operating um, during that fourth year. And he was uh, sent to a program for impaired physicians. So he became part of that system. He was there for several months and then eventually was allowed to continue his residency. To pull doctors in his residency admitted that they would see him like go out do drugs the night before and then go into these surgeries with these poor people oh no it's not safe one of his friends and i use that very loosely uh said that he would never allow dunch to operate on him red flag red flag big blazing red flag (laughs) yeah during that time in memphis during his residency He was not only doing drugs, but going to strip clubs where he met his wife, Wendy Young, and she was one of the dancers. And, like, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's definitely, like, different backgrounds and different, like, it's just very interesting that the two of them connected. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this young surgeon who's budding and really starting to take off in his career and yes he's doing pretty heavy drugs <laughs> and making some other questionable decisions um and for whatever reason he and wendy just really hit it off yeah he sounds like a very high risk person <laughs> yeah so it, it just was very very strange i don't know if he liked the attention that he was getting as a doctor at the strip clubs because that could I, definitely be it like okay he's a doctor he has money Let's go give him a little TLC. Mm -hmm. Make some money, girls. So that was a big appeal for her. She introduced herself and immediately moved in with him. Oh, my God. They hit it off. And they went on to have two boys together. Mm -hmm. However, they did break up just before the birth of their second son. He sounds so impulsive already, this guy. Very impulsive and... Like, he's almost lacking direction, too. Mm -hmm. Like, he obviously wanted the football career. That didn't work out. I think he just wanted to be successful and excel in something and make money. Yep. It wasn't, like, so much about caring for his patients. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, some people should not go into medicine. No. Absolutely should not go into medicine. Sounds like, definitely, after everything we've learned or will learn about this guy, it sounds like he definitely is one of those people. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's it's, it's very sad because in the end, the patients suffer. You know, it should be wanting to help people. And, and I, I know that there's people that go in to, like, have certain lifestyles. But when we learn more about Christopher Dunch, he has absolutely no regard for any of his patients. Even, like, his friends who he operated mm-hmm. on. Yeah. He did not have any regard for them. So here's my thing. There are nurses and other healthcare workers, surgeons, mm-hmm. that go in without you know, their main goal being to help people, which I think is fine. People Mm -hmm. can do it for different reasons. However, you do have to have at least a care for these patients and a drive to want to help them. Yeah. Because if you don't have any skin in the game, you don't have any link to these people and you don't really honestly care what happens to them at the end of the day and they suffer as a result. And you know what? That that is a great point and a great issue because overall patient care suffers without empathy Mm -hmm. and you know and i see those people who are in it get like not for like that desire to help they burn out so much faster than everyone else yep exactly when you're doing it for the money it's such an emotionally draining it's like draining in all ways like physically emotionally mentally Mm -hmm. And to, like, not have, like you said, skin in the game, you're going to get burnt. Yeah. So, 
But back to our boy, Chris originally was very focused on the PhD part of his degree. He actually was named in several different papers, like studies, which I thought was cool. Again, this guy's no dummy. And patents as well, which, you know, is going to obviously bring some kind of income in. Mm -hmm. And the Um, hospital and organization will benefit. Yeah, and it was specifically biotech startups. Hmm. Okay. Super cool. However, when Wendy and Chris met, he was over $500,000 in debt at that time. (sighs) Oh, God. So... When you have that enormous debt hanging over you, it's very hard to think about having a family. You know, how are you really going to have a lifestyle? I mean, you're making great money, but are you really going to have a lifestyle? And PhDs don't make as much as patient-facing roles. So at that point, he decided to shift once again. And he decided to become a neurosurgeon because it was very lucrative. Uh, Shortly after he moved to Dallas, Wendy came with him. And she was actually really excited because I guess she was from uh, Dallas. So. Hmm, okay. Win-win, right? Yeah. Again, I want to stress that this individual was very qualified at this point. Yes, that residency program, only giving him 100 hours, like, that was not appropriate. But he had 15 years of medical training, including medical school, residency, and then followed by a fellowship. Mm-hmm. He... um. Overall, his resume was 12 pages. Oh, my. So he's had a lot of experiences. He graduated magna cum laude, so with the highest praise, um, from St. Jude's Research Hospital with a degree in microbiology. However, this was simply not true. <gasps> mm-hmm. This program did not exist when he <gasps> attended. Mm-hmm. So... With those, like, very high accolades and everything else, there were a distinct web of lies woven in the middle of it. Okay, so explain. He did not go he to did not, St. They, Jude's? See, they did not even have that program. Oh, my God. When he went there. But he was smart. He was very, very smart. Very, very calculated. And he just very subtly wove because he was qualified. However, he elaborated and he he lied. Wow. Yep. And again, this paints a very distinct picture. Like, yes, we're not murdering anyone at this point, but still not a good dude. How did he get through all the... the... I don't understand. He said that he graduated from St. Jude's Research Hospital with a doctorate in microbiology. Uh Uh-huh. But that program did not exist oh. at all. He lied about it. The way that it was written it implied that it did exist after he attended, oh. but not while he was there. Did he? He didn't get his MD then. He did. Get, he did, but he's just and he is very very qualified. But in all of those uh, qualifications and like. Very high accolades. Oh, so all that stuff was embellished. He embellished. Okay, I get it. But it's not even just embellishing, because I embellish all the time. Yeah, that's true. He outright lied. He weaved his little web of bullcrap. So, get this. He's $500,000 in debt, right? He goes on and joins Baylor Regional Medical Center, which is now... Baylor Scott and White Medical Center. And he is a minimally invasive spinal surgeon. And guess how much he's making? How much? Just guess. Like 300K? No. How much? Just throw another number out there. 200? No. (gasps) $600,000. Paid off those loans, huh? He paid off those loans. And he said, look at that. So he definitely was making the money that he wanted to be. Baylor. Could you imagine making 600K if this podcast takes off? <laughs> <laughs> if this takes off, if everyone. this takes off, guys. Help us. <laughs> so while he was at Baylor, he made a very, very poor impression on his fellow uh, surgeons. 
veteran vascular surgeon, Randall Kirby. I want you to remember that name because he is a BAMF. A BAMF. BAMF. What's a BAMF? Bad ass. MF. (laughs) (laughs) Really, after, like, I did some research on this, I really liked Kirby. Like, truly liked Kirby. He was one of those people that had a set of cojones on him. Like, you wouldn't even believe. And he went on later on said that Dunch was very much overcompensating, very much bloated his skills. And he said about Dunch, Chris Dunch, he could not wield a scalpel. <gasps> Which as a surgeon is like a slap in the face. That's the highest insult, I think. That's they a magna cum get- laude insult. <laughs> <laughs> As Chris would say. <laughs> <laughs> Several of his surgeries at Baylor resulted in horrible outcomes. The first was Kenneth Fennell. He was left in chronic pain after Dunch operated on the wrong part of his back. <gasps> yep. That's a no-no. He later had a second operation to relieve that pain and was left to dunge do the second yes. surgery. Yes. Oh, God. And he was left paralyzed in his legs. After months and months of rehabilitation, he was able to walk with a cane. However, um, was unable to walk more than 30 feet. Wow. I would not let that guy touch me again. <laughs> I give them so much credit. Like yeah. you mess up one time. I, that's it. Um, there was a second gentleman, Lee Passmore, who was a medical investigator he had a chronic pain and limited mobility after Dunch cut a ligament, which was not supposed to be touched during that surgery, and then misplaced hardware in his spine. Oh, God. He placed a screw, which was supposed to keep that hardware in place, at the incorrect location of his spine. And then stripped that screw so that it would not be able to be removed. What do you mean stripped the screw? Like, you know when you like, strip, was able to. You, you can't take it out. Like, it's when you, like, use the screwdriver, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't even get it out because it's, like, all worn out in the middle. So did he, do you think he did that on purpose? Oh, Or yes. was it a big mistake, and he was trying to secure it, like, it, in where he thought was the correct spot? He was definitely calculated because that screw was also placed in a location in his back that if it was removed... He would have bled out. Mm -hmm. The vascular surgeon, Mark Hoyle, who assisted during the operation, said that Dunch was totally oblivious to the bleeding. He was so disturbed during that surgery that he physically restrained Dunch during the operation. And Dunch just kept going? He told Dunch he's dangerous and that he wondered if he was sane or not. That's how bad this was. And I'm sure the surgery stopped. But at that point, what can you do? You can't take out that hardware. If you take out the screw, by some miracle, you take out the screw, he's going to bleed out. Yeah. There's nothing that you can... It's a lose-lose. So you just got to close him up. He literally restrained him. And he said he doesn't think he's sane. You are dangerous. Imagine that. You're, like, so bad at your job. Like, no, this was malicious and this was intentional. And I could understand... But he put it in the wrong spot. Like, of all the checks and all the, like, even pre-op. Oh, what part of her body are you in? Like, it's so clear. It's so clear. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was definitely intentional. It was absolutely intentional. He had another doctor restrain him. And you know what else? Like, I know when we do certain procedures in the ER. Mm Mm-hmm. We always do a timeout. Yeah. And you need to make sure like it's the right site, the right procedure, the right patient. All all those details need to be known by everyone in the room at the time. Yes. You know what I mean? But that's just wild to me that it could have gone. But it, it becomes a pattern. And he like, as we talk about the other poor victims in this, he... In many surgeries he was doing, put it in the wrong spot. Mm. It's blatant. 
It's very blatant and it's very intentional. Did he want like a second correcting surgery to like, you know what I mean? Like that's what it makes me think of. Maybe he was doing it to be like, okay, you need to come back and have another surgery. Something went wrong in this surgery. But this individual, if they even were able to get that screw out and that hardware out, he would have bled out yeah. during that surgery. So, and it it's it's like so evil mm-hmm. that it's hard to like we're over here trying to rationalize. Like maybe it was a mistake, maybe. But as we go on, you're gonna see this was absolutely, absolutely intentional. Okay, there's too many parallels. Yeah. Okay. So the next victim at Baylor is Barry. Morgulov, who was an owner of a pool service company, and he was left with bone fragments in his spinal canal after Dunch tried to pull the damaged disc out of his back with a tool. Dunch refused to give Barry any pain medicine during that procedure and claimed that Barry was a drug seeker. (sighs) Yep. So after that, Barry lost most function on his left side and required a wheelchair. Kirby... D-A-M-F, okay. BAMF, assisted with the surgery and recalled that Dunch continued to make mistakes even after he had the correct anatomy pointed out to him. That's just, you know, frank disregard for what was appropriate. The patient later said that during a follow-up visit, Dunch was clearly drunk. Hmm. Mm hmm. Yup. Then Jerry Summers, who is Dunch's good friend, longtime friend, he came to Plano to have two neck vertebrae fused. Oh boy. <clears throat> so during that operation, Dunch tried to remove the disc, messed it up, and Jerry became a quadriplegic. Yup. So then he went on to have a second surgery, which. <laughs> Was even worse. With Dunch again? Mm-hmm. <gasps> mm-hmm. And he packed the uh, area where the disc was. Oh, no. With gel foam and then compressed the spinal cord. Oh, no. The anesthesiologist who also worked during that surgery recalled that Jerry lost 1,200 mLs of blood. Oh, that's over a liter. That's more than one-fifth. Of his total blood volume. Like in his whole freaking body. And that was 24 times the typical amount of blood lost during a spinal fusion. So massive amounts mm-hmm. of blood. Jerry later accused Dunch of doing drugs with him the night before the surgery. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I'm not victim blaming here, but I, I don't know if I would have. If I would have ever gone in afterward when I knew. <laughs> oh, he was lying. It doesn't look like it the was The patient? True. Yeah, the patient was oh, lying. Oh, okay, okay. They drug tested Dunch and they had, like, put him on leave. He waited, like, until they were able to do a peer review. However, during that review, he was clear to operate because the drug screen was clean. But he was supposed to be limited to only minor surgeries. Jerry later admitted that that cocaine claim, again, was untrue and that he was really upset that Dunch refused to check on him after the surgery. And I don't blame him. Mm-mm. I mean, I shouldn't say things that aren't true. No. But I would feel really hurt if my yeah. childhood best friend who did the freaking surgery never yeah, who's came the to reason? Sure I was okay. Yeah. He wasn't even upset about the fact that he paralyzed him he's like why like why didn't he come and see me you know what i mean yeah it was probably guilt oh yeah probably i hope so yeah or absolute disregard i don't know which one is worse jerry actually passed away in 2021 when do you not remember what year he had the surgery I, i think it was 2016 but don't quote me he was a quadriplegic obviously for the rest of his life and died in 2021, as a result of complications from that wow. surgery. It gets it honestly gets worse. I'm ready to hear. Kelly Martin was 
undergoing a just a routine back operation where Dunch cut through her spinal cord and severed an artery. <laughs> so this is a very clear MO where he's trying to make these patients bleed out. He continued operating despite seeing Kelly lose massive amounts of blood again. It's part of his MO and refused to stop the surgery, even after two other surgeons warned him about the blood loss. He refused to acknowledge anything was wrong and actively interfered with the ICU's team to save Kelly. Like, sabotaged. Oh, my God. And when Kelly woke up from the anesthesia, she was screaming, clawing, just absolutely, un- like, in distress. Mm-hmm. And the ICU team had to re-anesthetize her. Mm-hmm. He stayed in the ICU wait- waiting room writing notes rather than seeing Kelly again, avoiding his patients, and Kelly went into hemorrhagic cardiac arrest and later bled to death. I don't I don't even have any words for this guy here. I don't either. After that, Baylor found that Dunch did not meet their standards of care. And okay, very fair. <laughs> yeah. They initiated a second peer review, but Dunch quit rather than be fired. They were very worried about a wrongful termination suit. So hospital officials made a deal with Dunch's lawyer where he was allowed to resign and Baylor would write a letter saying that there was no issues. Um, And he's 100% good to go get a new position. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If Dunch had been fired... Baylor would have had to report him to the National Practitioner Data Bank, which is intended, it was designed to identify and flag problematic physicians. So physicians just like him. Yeah. So moving on, he began a position at Dallas Medical Center where he was granted temporary privileges until the hospital was able to get his records from Baylor. However, the red flags came up early on and nurses, shout out to the nurses, shout out, were saying that they thought that Dunch was under the influence of drugs Mm -hmm. while he was working there on a temporary basis. They mentioned that he would come to work in the same disgusting, beat up scrubs and he came with those same scrubs for three days in a row. And he was only there for a week before administrators pulled his privileges shortly after two of his patients were seriously injured. And good. Well, not dead. good that they were injured, but good that they pulled the privileges. It did not go well for one of them, and we'll get into that. Neither of them went well, but one of them resulted in absolutely devastating situation. So Floella was his first patient, and during his surgery, he severed Floella's vertebral artery and refused to stop the surgery. Again, there was massive blood loss. Mm -hmm. He packed it with too much of the stuff designed to stop the bleeding, which then caused her to have a stroke. Oh, Lord. So he did not respond to any messages from the hospital for several hours afterwards, And literally the next day after this horrible, horrible, horrible event, he booked an elective surgery with his next patient, Mary Efford, rather than making sure that Floella got the care that she needed. Hmm. On to the next one, I guess. Hospital officials were shocked that he refused to delay the second surgery and asked him multiple times, please care for Floella. Please care for Floella. Or if you're going, not going to care for her, transfer her out of your care. Yep. And he refused. So After- she was under his care. Yes. Still. Yeah. Afterward. Okay. He actually later on suggested drilling a hole in her head ah. to relieve the pressure, but they denied permission. Yep. So he's just doing whatever at this point. And I'm not a neurosurgeon. But that does not make sense to me. Me either. Again, not neurosurgeons. Not a neurosurgeon. But 
That just seems so bizarre. It it does. And, the and she had a stroke. They refused him to do that. He was not qualified for and held no privileges for brain surgery. Keep that in mind. And he wanted to be the one to drill her wow. forehead. And then she was left in a coma for hours and hours and hours before Dunch agreed to have her transferred. And at that time, she was already brain dead. It's like evil, evil, evil. And I yep. feel like, can you imagine? Like you go in, like she never came to after that surgery. Like that's so sad. Yeah. And just the complete disregard for hum- human life. Absolutely. And, you know, preserving health. So they allowed her him to move on to his second surgery, which blows my mind, which was Mary Efford. And Mary, well, during that surgery, he severed one of the nerve roots during the spinal fusion surgery, operated on the wrong part of her back again, twisted a screw into her nerve, and left holes on the opposite side of her spine, did not remove the disc that he was supposed to remove, and left surgical hardware in her muscle. So he's just butchering these people at this point. That's exactly, like, that is literally, I think, what they go on to say is butchering. That's such an apt description because it is absolutely evil, and these poor people are trusting him with their bodies. Mm -hmm. Like, they're literally going to sleep And trusting his hands to heal them. And he's actively destroying them. Mm -hmm. So during that surgery, the colleagues with him told him multiple times that he was not doing this correctly. And that he was putting the screws in muscle, not the bone. However, he continued on. Mary was paralyzed after that surgery, which is so evil and wrong. And she later recalled waking up feeling excruciating pain, which makes sense because not only does she have that screw in her nerve, she has that hardware in her muscle. Can you imagine that? So painful. And several people who are in the OR at that time during that surgery later said that they believed that he was intoxicated under the influence of something. Yeah, something's up, definitely. Pupils were... There was a veteran spinal surgeon, Robert Henderson, remember that name also, who tried to salvage what had happened to Mary. When he went in and saw what happened, he was certain that there would be legal action. So he had them record the entire surgery. And he said that when he opened her up, it looked like someone, a child, had been playing with Tinker Toys or an erector set. He said it was an assault in that if this salvage surgery had not been performed, Mary would have been bedridden. Wow. It's horrible. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely awful. And here you see a surgeon who, you know, actually cares about the patient and wants to fix the problem and not cause more havoc. To what's going on with them. Well, it was so bad that he didn't even know if this was a real surgeon. He went on to verify that he had graduated from the University of Tennessee. And it was confirmed. He also called Dunch's fellowship supervisor in Memphis. As well as the supervisor of his residency. Now, keep in mind, during his residency, he was referred to the impaired physician program. Mm -hmm. And that came up. Good. So, clearly, the accusations of him being under the influence of something during that surgery, they bared more weight because of that history of being part of, yeah. So, despite both of these surgeries being horrible and awful and catastrophic, hospital officials did not report him. They did not report him because, this was the rationale, he only had temporary privileges. So after that, he began working at Southampton Community Hospital in Dallas, and he took a job at outpatient clinic called Legacy Surgery Center in Frisco, okay? While there, he continued his massacre. He damaged, and I'm going to 
say all these patients' name because these patients are victims and they deserve to be recognized. There are, I think there was like 38 people that he did surgery on that he absolutely butchered. So I just want to make sure that we're including everyone. So while there, he damaged Jeff Cheney, his spinal cord, and he had no feeling on the right side of his body. He then did surgery on Philip Mayfield, also his spinal cord. He drilled into it and left him partially paralyzed from the neck down. Um, after extensive rehabilitation, he was able to walk with a cane. However, would have paralysis on the right side of his body and also in his left arm. He had shooting pain and later died recently in February 2021 from COVID-19. And according to his wife, he was very vulnerable to COVID-19 because complications caused by Dunch doing surgery on him. So even though he didn't die immediately after the surgery, these people's lives have been so impacted and they've become so impaired that they are open to a myriad of issues. Like this is the second person that we've talked about that died from complications later on from the surgeries. So it's affecting them for years and years, years and years. And then they passed away mm -hmm. due to complications or being more vulnerable because of that. He also began an operation to remove degenerated discs in Marshall Muse's back. And he left surgical hardware floating mm -hmm. in between the spine and the muscle tissue. Muse woke up in pain, but Dunch was like, oh no, it's totally normal. Don't even worry about it. He then prescribed Muse a boatload of Percocet, so much so that the pharmacist refused to fill the prescription. He swings so much from one to the other, just like how there was a guy at the beginning, a patient of his that was complaining of pain and he refused to medicate because he thought he was drug seeking. And now you're on the other end of the pendulum and you're over prescribing Percocet to a patient. It's, it's awful because now Muse's life has totally taken a nosedive. He became addicted to opioids, lost his wife, lost his job. And it's like, unbelievable, unbelievable. Next patient was Jacqueline Troy. He cut one of her vocal cords in an artery and damaged her trachea. She was not able to speak more than a whisper and had to be sedated for weeks after the surgery and was fed during a feeding tube. And during that time, it sounds like she had a little pneumonia because food from the feeding tube was going into her lungs. Oh, boy. So awful, 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 awful. Despite those surgeries and their outcomes, he was retained by that hospital even when it came under new ownership and it became the University General Hospital. He then applied for privileges also at Methodist Hospital in Dallas and part of the onboarding process, the hospital looked at the NPDP, so the National Prescriber Database. Soon afterwards, he maimed another patient Glidewell, um, after he mistook part of his neck muscle for a tumor. <gasps> yep. During a routine cervical fusion, severed his vocal cord, cut a hole in his esophagus, and sliced an artery. So he's, there's so much overlap with some of the other victims. Like, this is the second patient now that he severed a vocal cord. So this just shows how purposeful this was all so intentional. It absolutely was. It absolutely was. Now, this was very blatant. Dunch stuffed a surgical spun in his throat, in Glidewell's throat, to help stop the bleeding because there was so much, right? And he closed him with the sponge in place, despite other people in the OR telling him he still has that sponge. Oh, my God. Closed it. He's like, now nah, we're good. We're good. Now we're good. The sponge then triggered a severe infection, which of course led him to become septic. I'm shocked. <laughs> so he became septic yeah. from this. When other doctors found the sponge. Where was it? 
In his, in his throat. throat. Yep. After he sliced that artery. Dunch refused to help remove the sponge afterwards. Wanted no part of it. He wanted no part of his patients after he hurt them. After several days, Kirby. We love Kirby. We love you, Kirby. He was brought in to repair the damage and described what he found as the work of a crazed maniac. Sounds pretty accurate. He told Edwell that it was clear Dunch had tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. He told the patient that he was left with one vocal cord, permanent damage to his esophagus, and partial paralysis on his left side. Kirby said that it looked like Dunch had tried to decapitate. (gasps) Yep, yeah, that's the word he used, decapitate Glidewell, and said that such a bot surgery has not happened in the United States of America before. Like, that is crazy. And this, Kirby went in, tried to fix things up, and he's still not, is not doing great. So he is still dealing with the result of the surgery despite Kirby going in. And... He had more than 50 procedures to try to help correct the damage. 50. And at one point, he was only able to eat small bites of food at one time. He was the last surgery that Dunch did at that hospital. And University General pushed him out soon afterwards. Good. After that massacre, Kirby went to the Texas Medical Board and called Dunch a sociopath who was a clear and present danger to the citizens of Texas. Thank God for Kirby, because, you know, in all the cases, I feel like people just let things slide. They're like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to mind my business. But thank God Kirby said something. And like D always says, if you see something, say something. Yeah. If you see something you're uncomfortable with or that causes harm to the patient or can cause harm to the patient, always say Always say something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So moving on. Kirby. We love Kirby. He spoke his mind and the Texas Medical Board suspended Dunch's license. Good. Long overdue. In 2013. The investigator on the case revealed that she wanted Dunch to have his license suspended while the investigation was underway. However, attorneys were not willing to go along with this. They found it very hard to believe that a trained surgeon can be so incompetent and argued that complications in neurosurgery were far more common than you and I, like lay people, might believe. I understand. You know, I understand that there's complications, especially when you're in such a delicate field. However, the patterns of his patients are just evidence of how negligent and careless his actions were he uh, yeah i think that's very well put and a veteran neurosurgeon that the medical board consulted said you cannot be a surgeon and not notice the signs that Mm -hmm. he missed when his patients were bleeding out Mm -hmm. and the fact that he was reminded And he was reminded so many times, like, about the guy with the sponge stuck in his throat. It's like, no, I'm good. We don't need to remove the sponge from his throat. I'm good. Really? Okay. Well, your patient went into septic shock and almost died. So look at that. They knew what they were talking about. So the Texas Medical Board revoked Dunch's license that same year. And Dunn shortly after moved to Denver, Colorado, and he just went on a total spiral down. He declared bankruptcy. He listed his debt over $1 million. He was arrested for a DUI, had a psychiatric evaluation during one of his visits with his kid, and was arrested for shoplifting. So definitely had a downward spiral. In 2014, three former patients, Mary Efford, Kenneth Fennell, and Lee Passmore, They all filed separate federal lawsuits against Baylor and said that the hospital allowed Dunch to perform surgeries despite knowing that he was dangerous. Mm. The Texas Attorney General 
and governor intervened and defended Baylor. They, I guess, cited some 2003 statute about civil damages being capped um, at $250,000. Um, they did some legal maneuvering and basically tried to shut those lawsuits down and protect Baylor. But what came out of the suit is that Baylor made an average of $65,000 on every spinal surgery that Dunch did. Henderson and Kirby were very afraid that even though he had his medical license revoked in Texas, that he would move and somehow get a medical license again. Mm. They believed that he was very much a danger to the public and urged the Dallas County DA's office to pursue criminal charges, which is crazy. The inquiry really went nowhere until 2015 when the statute of limitations was about to fall off. They interviewed several of Dunch's patients and concluded that Dunch's actions were criminal and nothing short of imprisonment would stop him from hurting people again. Mm. And when I say hurting people, I mean practicing medicine. There was an email in December 2011 in which Dunch said, he's ready to leave the love and kindness and goodness and patience that I mix with everything else that I am and become a cold-blooded killer. A little too late for that change. <laughs> it's already it, happened. No, it happened. It, it happened. Oh, wait, wait. This was 2011. Yes. <gasps> He was going to leave that all behind and become a cold-blooded killer. And that was instrumental in the case. Henderson, Kirby, Lazar, they all, they all insisted that they testify against Dunch. And doctors almost never testify against each other. 2015, one and a half years later, after his license was revoked, Dunch was arrested and charged with six felony counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, five counts of aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury, and one count of injury to an elderly person. These charges were made only four months before the statute of limitations were going to run out. They waited to the last minute. The key charge in this was the last one for maiming and paralyzing Mary Effort, who was an older person. They put a very high priority on that charge because that had this, um, like a sentence long enough so that Dunch would never be able to come out and practice medicine again. So they tried him for that or that surgery. Surgery. I use that term very loosely. First, he was held in the Dallas County Jail for two years until the case went to trial in 2017. So this is all very, very recent. Mm -hmm. During that time, Dunch had no money because he was also being sued personally. The hospitals were throwing him under the bus. And, you know, all of those lawyers fee plus filing for bankruptcy. He has no money at this point. Mm -hmm. So, which is very ironic because prosecutors argued that Dunch was motivated to continue operating because of that lucrative $600,000 a year salary. And that he would pursue that in order to make those funds back. They called so many patients to the stand. And this was done in order to establish that all of his actions were intentional. Um, according to his defense, Dunge said that he did not realize how poorly his work was during those surgeries until he heard these experts tell the jury about mm -hmm. all of his mistakes. This is where it comes back for the 100 hours versus the 1,000 hours he was supposed to get mm -hmm. because they blamed Dunch's actions on his, quote-unquote, poor training and lack of oversight by the hospitals. Defense did that? Yeah. They said, oh, well, he was supposed to have 1,000 hours. He had 100 hours, so it's not his fault. And then... Also, I do agree with them about the lack of oversight by the hospitals. It was the individual doctors who took a stand. Yeah. Which I really respect. I agree. No, the hospitals should have definitely played a role in this. But 
you need to have that, you know, clinical judgment to be able to practice yeah, and be responsible enough to know when you're not able to. And take direction. Mm -hmm. Don't come to work messed up on drugs. Don't do surgeries Mm -hmm. while you're under the influence of something. Yep. Like, come on. This is common sense. But that email, again, bit him in the butt. And they said that that email was sent out after his surgeries went wrong, which proved that those actions were intentional. The email was sent after his first surgeries went wrong. Oh, okay. So right when he first started going mm-hmm, doing it. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. So after 13 days of a trial, the jury decided in four hours that he was convicted for Mary, the elder. Good. And um, in 2017 was sentenced to life in prison. So he has filed for appeals since then, which he has been denied for. And also during this time, the hospitals have ongoing civil cases against him. He is still in jail at this time. He is not eligible for parole until 2045. And he will be 74. So he's not practicing surgery. Perfect. (laughs) This was a precedent-setting case because it was the first time in the United States where a physician has been convicted for criminal charges for actions in the course of their medical work. This is a historic case. Mm -hmm. And this has been on Peacock. This has been its own podcast, Dr. Death. Yeah. This has been like a whole big thing where a lot of people are talking about it. And and the thing in a lot of people's minds, it's just so crazy because this is someone who invested so much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if if you don't care about your patients, care about your work. You know what I mean? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what it really comes down to. But. He really thought that he was protected and that, you know, uh, he was going to get away with this. And clearly he didn't. No. No. Now he's in jail. He's in jail. And, you know, I just I feel so bad for those people, the victims, because, again, I've had surgeries before. And I just think to like I trusted my surgeon. Yeah. You have to. You have to. You have to. And it's heartbreaking that this trust was put in such terrible evil hands you're so vulnerable and you're trusting this person to you know make your life better not worse and actively try to sabotage it it's just crazy but i think that is all i got for tonight great job d as always i'm exhausted like yeah (laughs) and tonight we're going to eat some chicken no we're gonna eat some caesar salad can't wait and um Thank you all for listening. Tune in again next week. D, great job on this case. Thank you. This is I'm I'm very happy I learned more about this because I'd heard of it. I just never really delved deeply into it. But you did great. And thank you all for listening. Um, I'm gonna call it. It is 1936 for those of you who use military time and 7 36 p.m. for those of you who do not. Um, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you. And uh, you're killing it, babe. Yeah, keep killing it. Bye. Bye.